Well, amen. Praise the Lord for the, those songs and that testimony. Man, I tell you that, that is, uh, um, if that didn't stir your soul today, uh, I'm going to pray that God will awaken your soul uh, to the goodness of, of that, that uh, a man's been delivered from darkness and brought into the light. Um, and to know Josh and to know what God is, is doing, has done in his life, it's just a, a sweet thing uh, to be able to participate in that. I'm so grateful uh, for God's mercies uh, to us all. Uh, my name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, as I get underway this morning talking to you, you can see that today is uh, a little bit of a different day. If you're visiting with us, you'll see some white tables around the edges of the auditorium. Uh, and that signifies that uh, we're going to be taking communion today. Um, most people who are familiar uh, with Christians understand that they do this uh, strange thing where they take uh, the cup and they break some bread and do these things. This has been a confusing thing uh, to people outside the body of Christ or the people who name the name of Christ. One of the earliest uh, slanders that was uh, uh, bantied about in the first century uh, to kind of condemn Christians and think that Christians were weird people is uh, two things. They got together and did some unsavory things. Uh, they kind of uh, given to sensuality and debauchery. That was one. And the second thing is that they were cannibals. They got together and drank blood and ate somebody's flesh. That's what they said. And what they meant by that is that in the, in the history of the church, Christians got together before, traditionally, before they celebrated what's known as communion with a love feast. It was called an agape feast, a love feast. And that's where it would be kind of the, the first century equivalent to a potluck supper. Everybody would bring something in. If you want to read about it, you can read about it in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, because it's the passage where we deal with communion because they were messing it up so badly uh, in Corinth. But they got together and they shared together to, to visually demonstrate that we're family. We belong to each other. So there wasn't anything uh, unseemly going on at all other than people sharing their meals with each other. And then the second part, of course, is they were uh, drinking the fruit of the vine. They were drinking some grape juice together, and they were uh, taking bread and breaking it up into pieces and celebrating the communion. Uh, and that, of course, uh, was to uh, symbolize uh, the fact that they believed in Jesus Christ and the uh, bread symbolized the breaking of his body, his death on their behalf, and the shedding of his blood had to do with the same symbolism of his death that had inaugurated, had put in place this new arrangement that God made possible by believing in Jesus, that your sins could be forgiven, that you could be made new and be righted in your relationship with God. But those were a picture of those, and today we come uh, to picture those uh, in the celebration of our communion. And at Emmanuel, we practice what's called an open communion, where if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you're welcome to join us at the Lord's table, uh, if you know him. Uh, but these comments that I have today are prefacing us uh, to think about this moment uh, and to enter into it uh, well. I, I've said this to many of you uh, at other moments. Uh, if you have been around the church for a while, uh, one of the difficulties of being people who are on the way people who are growing but have not been fully conformed to the image of Christ, have not fully grown into everything that God wants us to do and to be, is sadly we get bored with things that are really, really good. And one of the things that uh, I want to encourage you, one of the reasons why we preface it and we spend it here is because we, we need to be drawn afresh and anew by the Spirit of God back into the realities that these elements symbolize. And that's what we want to do today. We need to be brought back into the truth that the world is truly the world that God rules and reigns. That today we celebrated the greatest deliverance of, of any kind of deliverance that you could have. Your real threat is not COVID to your life. The real threat is not your colleagues or the people at your work. The real threat is not uh, foreign invaders to the United States. The real threat that everyone faces that only Jesus can deliver you from is the wrath of God. And this moment celebrates the deliverance of all deliverances that gives purpose, meaning, direction uh, to life. And we want to re-enter that. And it's something that by God's grace, 
Uh, we need his help to be something that we never get over it. We never get over it. So I want to direct your attention to a passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you would turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, first letter of Paul to the church at Corinth. We're going to be in this uh, book uh, the whole time this morning in our short reflections. But I want you to turn there. If you would turn and please come to chapter 10 and verse 14. And if I could ask you to stand with me as we read God's word together. We're going to read verses 14 to 22 uh, and then reflect on it a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not, did, uh, do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? May the Lord add his blessing to reading his word. You may be seated. We're going to talk about this idea of participation this morning. Uh, many of you that if you know any of the Greek words, the, people know a few, right? Like agape for love. A logos for word, but another one that many people know is one koinonia for fellowship. That's the word that's translated participation in all the time. And participation is to partake in, to share in something. And we got to see a, a, a wonderful example as I was thinking about illustrating this this morning. I just needed to wait till Josh gave his testimony today uh, to give an example of it. Right, Josh uh, had grown up around spiritual things. He'd grown up around Christianity, right? So it wasn't that, that when uh, that moment came when Josh started being, stopped being an observer, or if you will, a user of Christianity, right? So Josh found, and this is very key, found in the circles that he was in, that he could use Christianity to get by. He could use Christianity to be perceived as a good guy or to, to get along in a given group of people and just not cause difficulty, right? So Christianity becomes some sort of device for him to live out his life as he saw. Well, he was around it all the time. He heard it, right? And I know from Josh's past, he went to chapels at school and he heard it. Uh, he'd been in church services and he heard it. He'd had people that talked to him about uh, the fact that he was estranged from God because of his sin, that he'd rebelled against God, that Jesus had died in his place, that Jesus had taken care of what he rightfully deserved, and he needed to put his faith in Jesus, transfer his trust from everything else to Jesus and give his life over to Christ. He'd heard that many, many, many times, right? But he had passively been around it. He had heard it, neglected it, right? Figured out ways to be perceived as a Christian, even though he wasn't, and to use Jesus to get his way forward as best as he saw uh, his life being. And as Josh testified, right, things were not going well. But at one moment, he became a participant. At one moment, he became a participant when he believed what God was telling him about himself, when he believed what Jesus had done on his behalf, and when he gave up trying to make sense of his life on his own, and then he cried out to God to do something for him that he couldn't do for himself. Then he became a participant in it. He joined in. He was no longer on the outside. He was no longer an observer. He was no longer somebody who was just trying to figure out how to navigate world with a bunch of Christians in it that he had to figure out how to get around or get by. Now he had put both feet in by God's loving favor into a commitment to Jesus Christ. And this, as we come to this table, right, as just with the water over here, as Van was talking about, there's nothing magical about these elements. As we pray and, and, and interact with them, they don't become something than they are. They are grape juice and a sad little wafer today, 
right, is what we have. They don't become anything, uh, no matter how many times we pray, that sad little wafer is the same sad little wafer, right? And it doesn't do something magical to you, right? What it is, it's symbolizing an event that if you have participated in it, it has changed your life. And it's drawing you back into that event. It's drawing you back into it, not only for you to reflect and thanks and praise for what Jesus did, but it's also calling you back into it that now that you have believed in him by faith, that you've trusted him, that you've cast yourself on his mercy, it's reminding you of who you are and what's necessary for you to fully enjoy this new life that God has given you. And it's calling you back into the truth that you're really not primarily an employee. You're really not primarily a husband or a wife. You're really not primarily a citizen of the United States. You are a son or daughter of the king. And you're, you're a redeemed sinner who's been brought to Christ and have been made new. And that reshapes what it means for you to be a husband or a wife. That reshapes for you what it means for you to be a parent. That reshapes for you what it means to be a citizen. That reshapes for you what it means to you be an employee. And that is the fundamental thing that drives everything in your life. And so we do this because Jesus, right? The reason that Josh was baptized is because Jesus said, I want you to institute this practice so that you're constantly reminded and you constantly testify to the reality of what happens to a person when they believe in Jesus. That symbol is to constantly take you back to the truth that when Josh believed in Jesus, he died to an old Josh. He died to an old way of living. And it was something that happened deeply on a spiritual level that he got new appetites, new desires, a new disposition, a new understanding of himself. And as he grows into it and understands his new identity, it changes everything. It not only changes the way he lives, the way he understands himself, but it changes his destiny. Right? It's taken hell out of his future and put heaven in there. It's changed everything about him. Right, And we get to, and, and I, this today was one of those days where I was going to just kick Grace and, and Jacqueline after seeing Josh up here. I thought it was just going to be a weepy mess before I got up here just thinking about the sweetness of what happened right there. How dramatic and wonderful that is of what happened in that moment. And we were just celebrating those things today. So today, we're coming back to something that Jesus equally commanded. He sat down before he died, and he got together with his disciples, and he says, I want you to do this, to remember me, right? And of course, this kind of remembrance, as we're talking about here, is a remembrance that doesn't just recall some things from the past, but it brings the past event of what Jesus did into contact with the present in order to change the present. Right? It's not that we just go back and we think about something. This, this Jesus who died right, is the Jesus who raised. And so he's the living, reigning Lord of the church. He's not some past historical figure that we go back and reflect on and learn some lessons from his life. We go back to look at this moment that literally changed everything. And he died for the sins of the world, came out of the grave, and he lives and rules and reigns. He has dispensed his spirit, as we sang about. And this, this thing of the church is moving forward to proclaim that the king has come, and the king has opened the way into the kingdom, and the king is going to return, and you better be ready for his return. Right? And so we're remembering, right, two things. We're going to remember the Lord's death as we talk about it, until when? Until he comes, right? So it situates us in the real story of what's going on, right? And often sometimes we get caught up politically, we get up personally in a story of what's going on in our individual lives or the lives of the people around us, and we forget to realize that our story is a part of a much bigger story that needs to constantly be brought to bear on my marriage, that constantly needs to be brought to bear on my employment. That constantly needs to be brought to bear on my parenting. That constantly needs to be brought to bear on my identity and purpose and direction. Right. So there's three things here I just want to reflect on. If you have your, your, your bulletins here today or your program, you have a little bit of notes in there. You can fill in the blanks with me. And we want to talk about, as we think about the communion, about what it is that we are celebrating or reminding ourselves that we have participated in. What does it mean that we have taken part in something? And here's the very first one. We've taken part in Christ, meaning we belong to Christ. Okay, we belong to Christ.
It says here, it says, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry, right? From other sorts of gods that you worship. I speak to sensible people, judge for yourself, is not the cup of thanksgiving in which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ, right? Is, and not, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. And here he's speaking about the idea that when we believed in Jesus, to believe in Jesus to simply say, God, I believe what you say about me, that I'm lost, I'm broken, that I've sinned, that I, I can't make it on my own. I believe that truth. I believe that the death of Jesus was for me, and it was what was the only thing that could save me and deliver me from the state I was in. And I was in a place where I deserved your judgment because I had rebelled against you, and so please do for me what I can't do for myself. And so I throw myself on the mercy of God and do that. And when I participated in it, I get all the benefits of what Jesus did in his death, right? I get all the benefits. He died to, an, uh, to sin, and I died to sin. I'm freed from its curse. We sang about that, right? I don't have to know the penalty for my sin, but also it means I've been freed from its bondage. I don't have to give in to it. Matter of fact, I've been made to live differently. So I belong to him. But even more than that, he owns me. Right? One of the saddest things is to find someone who has nobody to belong to. Nobody wants to own them. Nobody says they're mine. And here Jesus said, she's mine. They participate. Not only do we get all the benefits, but we get the ongoing care of Jesus. This is why the communion is a celebration of what Jesus has done in the past. And it's entering into the joy of the promise he's given about the future. We get hope. So I don't know what the darkest thing that you're facing as a believer right now. Depression, anxiety, relational struggles, unemployment, disease. Jesus says you belong to me. I'm going to take care of all that. I'm going to, I'm going to provide you the resources to live in this moment, to know joy and matter of fact, to live beyond your circumstances in ways that the only way people are going to explain your life is saying that person has to have some sort of power from God to live that way. And then he's going to take you home and rectify everything. I don't know what injustice you have experienced. The just judge will take care of that. So you belong to him, right? You belong to Christ, right? He owns you. And the good thing about this kind of ownership, I, I would call it, you know, I, I'm an owned person today, happily. Right? Ronna Kowser owns me. And I gave her ownership, right? Man? That's the way scripture talks about marriage, right? And, and uh, I, I promised that I would keep myself to her and her alone for long as we both shall live. And that my, my stuff, my material possessions, they belong to her. Everything about that, right, belongs to her. I'm happy to, be, to belong to her. To belong to Jesus is to be owned in the sweetest way possible. Is to have everything directed toward you for your blessing. The God of the universe who creates everything, who sustains everything, who brings everything to its ultimate goal is the one who will unleash his power for your blessing and for ultimately your salvation. You belong to him, right? And today you don't want to forget who you belong to who you belong to. This is why you can even, as a follower of Jesus, because you belong to Jesus, you can take the rejection of other people when you tell them about Jesus because you belong to Jesus. This is why within our friendships as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can sometimes, we have to stand into each other's life and confront each other when we lose our minds and we can put up with the threat of sometimes a person abandoning us or turning on us because we belong to Jesus, right? So that's the first one, we belong to Jesus by participating. The second one, right? We've taken, we've taken on a new identity. We belong to each other, right? We've taken on a new identity. We belong to each other, right? This one here, verse 17, because there is one loaf, 
we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf, right? If you're around Christian circles, you'll hear people refer to the church as a body, and it sounds like an odd thing, right? Uh, even though you, we've heard, used the term sometimes politically or different things like this deliberative body of people, right, who are coming together to do something. But here, this is actually a metaphor, a picture that the Apostle Paul develops about the nature of the kind of relationship that we have because we are all believers in Christ. It isn't that you have this Jesus here, and then I believe in Jesus, and she believes in Jesus, and he believes in Jesus, but there's no connections that go between the people other than the fact that we believe in Jesus. No, we believe in Jesus, and the picture is that we become a part of this kind of living organism, this body, so that I, I'm a part of something that's intimately connected to every other part. You can read about it in, later on in 1 Corinthians 12, right? And so Paul will try to break out the analogy. Some of us are eyes, some of us are hands, some of us are legs, some of us are, you know, heels, I don't know, right, whatever, right? We're just different parts of the body of Christ, but I, I, I'm actually a part of you. And matter of fact, how if I'm healthy and if I function well, it, right, it blesses the whole body. If I'm sick, it hurts the whole body. And so I'm so you that this isn't a lecture hall, this isn't a group of people who come together because they happen to like the aesthetics of the auditorium, even though I know that's what everybody's here for, right? It's not because you're here because of, of the great, you know, uh, 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 performance and concert that happens here every time, you know, or the light show, you know, we could get some other lights, but it's not those kinds of things. People are not here for those. We're here because this is a family of people I belong to, and I have responsibilities toward them. How I live out my life during the week will impact what kind of person I am. I need to walk with Jesus on my own so that I can become a person here that encourages other people, right? I come to this body for help. I come to this body when I'm struggling. I come to this body to deal with things that, that I feel like, and Josh was talking about this, things I feel like are so heavy that I'm struggling to carry on my own, and I bring it up to other brothers and sisters in Christ, and they help me to, to hold it up and run toward Jesus, so I belong to them, right? I belong to you. You belong to me, right? We just took on a new responsibility this morning. And Josh took on a whole lot more, right? We got one, he got all of us, right? But now we belong to each other, right? And that's different, right? You have a place to belong. The evil one's going to tell you that you're alone and nobody cares about you. And Jesus comes back and says, you belong to me, right? And then it's going to make you want to be, the evil one wants to make you selfish, self-centered, everything about you. And he's going to say, no, no, you belong to this body. You have responsibilities for them. This isn't all about you, right? You're involved in something much bigger, right? And so... Two things, right, about this participation. We belong to Jesus and we belong to each other, right? Now, let me follow up one thing in terms of what we said in James. We're all sons and daughters of God who believe in Jesus. There's no favorite sons, no favorite daughters. God doesn't do that, right? If you were, grew up in a family where there was more than just one, right, sibling, you had that that, that debate about whether you were the favorite son or she was the favorite daughter, right? And you were certain, of course, that it was the youngest one because they got away with everything, right? All that kind of thing, like you said, oh, your dad's favorite, your mom's favorite, your thing. God doesn't do that. We're all his favorites. We're all his children. None of us has any more value to God than any other one. And God forgive us when we elevate people on worldly grounds over each other doesn't make any difference how much money you have doesn't make any difference how much education you have doesn't make any difference how what kind of positions of power influence you have none of that matters you're a son or daughter of God and the joy that you come in not that it was such a great deal that God had to get you it's such a wonderful deal that given who you are that God has anything to do with you that is the wonder and God forgive us as the people of God when I come in that I pick and choose on a worldly scale the people that I want to associate with. God forgive us when we get embarrassed with each other because of worldly standards. Right? That person didn't say it right. That person doesn't carry themselves right. That person doesn't know the right lingo about this issue. When you have a family, right? 
Uh, all families have goofy uncles, right? All families have uh, different things that go along. We're all at different ages of maturity, but one thing that we, we are is that we're all family members who love each other deeply and profoundly, and you don't abandon your family. You don't get ashamed of your family. I want to be associated with every believer, I don't care what they know and don't know, who believes in Jesus Christ and is trusting in his resurrection than the smartest guy or girl who denies Jesus and makes him to be someone to be dismissed and forgiven, forgotten. So we are belong to each other. Then finally, right, take down idols. We belong to Christ alone. We belong to Christ alone. He has our first allegiance, right? And the rest of that, what Paul's talking about here is in the dynamic is that in the first century world, and matter of fact, it's not unusual if we were in Eastern Europe today, if we were in uh, Africa, if we were in South America, if we were in Haiti, if we were in different places like this, uh, this would, you would be reading about these things sacrificed to idols and people would be thinking, well, he's speaking right to us today in terms of that. And the dynamic of the first century is that you had people who were coming out of pagan religions. And in, in the pagan world of the first century, uh, it was almost um, uh, uh, rare, if ever, that you would find an atheist. You find people who were polytheists. And as polytheists who believed in many gods, everything had religious services around it. And so if you went to a guild meeting because you were a coppersmith, you would have a patron deity that you would sacrifice the food to before you would eat. And you would be appealing to that deity to bless your trade so that you could make money and provide for your families and gain wealth and so forth and so on, right? Uh, if you were a part of, of any sort of group, you would have some sort of patron deity. And so you were constantly going to the temples and having these kinds of feasts around them. And matter of fact, even if you were just involved and employed as a coppersmith and you just came to Christ, you would have your guild meeting at a local temple where they had like uh, event rooms that they would rent out where people would come and eat there right, and appeal to the God and so forth and so on. So what, what do these Christians do? How do they go in and deal with these? And Paul is warning them that there are no other gods. There's only one God. But yes, there is demonic activity. And what these people are is they're deceived and they're caught up and they're being persuaded by the evil one to give rein to their rebellion and you don't want to participate in that. You don't want to be given to that kind of idolatry. You want to testify to the fact that you worship Christ and Christ alone, right? And it took wisdom for them to do that. For us, right? I belong to him. He alone provides what I need for life now and to come. And I want to trust in him and him alone. It's not my friend group that I trust in, right? This is one of the things that happens. You know that idolatry is there in your life as a Christian when you're willing to, to kick Christ to the curb to preserve something else. If you've got a relationship with a guy or a girl and you have to diminish your commitment to Christ to keep that relationship going, that is an idolatrous relationship. Right? If you've got a friend group at school and you feel pressure to dumb down your commitment to Christ and that group becomes more important to you than your commitment to Christ, that is an idolatrous relationship. If you're at work, right? And again, this takes wisdom, takes wisdom, all these things that we talk about as believers, and, and, and you have to hide and you do hide your commitment to Christ so that you can move forward. There's an idolatrous relationship there. And so here it's reminding, it, it's, it's silly if the only one that can deliver you, the one who's wise enough and strong enough to tell you who you are and to deliver you from the things that really threaten you, that all of a sudden you would think that you need to put him in your pocket so that you can make it through life. Now, I've used this with you before. I have this wedding ring on my, on my finger here, which I can get off on occasions, or most of the time I can't. Um, I don't try, I don't take it off. Matter of fact, I forget it's there because it's just been there uh, uh, since the time when I lost my first one. That's another story. Uh, but <laughs> it's been there for that, for that period of time. And, and I have it here. But, but, but one of the things that, that it does is it would be super sketchy, right? Any woman who knows this like that, if every time I went out in public, I took my ring off. 
I took my ring off and I just put it in my pocket. And I'm not talking about taking it off because I, I do crazy things that I need to take my ring off. I'm talking about I just don't want to publicly identify with my wife. And here is, as followers of Jesus today, we, we, we identify with him. We participate in the benefits of his death on our behalf. So the three things that we were going to just talk about today. I belong to Jesus. Thank God that he has me. I belong to Jesus. Right? We belong to each other. And the only way that we can navigate the life that he wants us to have, to be the kind of people for the blessing of the people in our lives, have no other, other gods before him. I want to invite you, before we come, and this is the practice here, I want to invite you to reflect uh, on your life. And you'll find this in, in 1 Corinthians 11, if you want to turn over there with me, just maybe a page over from where you are. You know, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that, that remembering does, right, is it takes you back into the truth of something, and calls you to ask the question, you know, God, am I, really, am I really thankful and celebrating and giving you praise for the fact that, that I belong to you? And some of it is just we just need to be reminded that we've lost the wonder of the fact that Christ has delivered us. And, and, and therefore, because we've lost the wonder of it, as we come into challenges where people are challenging us to go a different way than what Christ, we don't have the, the motivation of love to constrain us. Paul said that the, that the key motivating factor of his life was the love of Christ constrains me. And so maybe you need to just come before the Lord and spend some time thanking him for what he's done. Lord, that you would have me. Maybe... Maybe you've forgotten the joy of being united to his people, <laughs> right? You get irritated, right? You get irritated with other people. You get irritated when people don't do what you want them to do, when they obviously, if they did it the way you wanted it to be done, it'd be done a whole lot better, right? You don't get your way, or you get irritated by people, or you find out, surprised that there's some brokenness and hypocrisy among God's people. And you forget to look at yourself to recognize that it's evident in you too. And then you get graceless and all of a sudden you want to throw people out. And Jesus said, you know, that's your family. That's your family. I brought you to them. You belong to them. Matter of fact, your ability to reflect what I want you to show about what I am doing is, is that you need to love that group of people. You don't get a bailout on them. You get a bail out. You don't bail out because that's what the world does. It bails out on people. We don't bail out on people. I don't mean that it's not difficult to love one another from time to time, but that's not the option. To bail is not the option. And maybe you need to confess some things where you've shut yourself off from some people in the body of Christ. And you and I both know that we can do that and still have smiles on our faces when we see them. You can shut your heart off from people. You don't pray for them. You don't pray for God's blessing. You just try to push them to the side of your life. It's not how you operate in a family. Maybe we're letting something else put Jesus in our pocket. Don't know what it is. But I, one thing I'm confident is because God loves you that he is too loving to let you go on in behavior that's killing you. <laughs> and if you give him space, he'll bring it to mind. And, and the sweetness of Jesus is that if you own it and you come to me and ask for forgiveness, I'll give it to you. And I'll put you right back. And I don't need you to ask for forgiveness, but you need to seek forgiveness. You need to be free of the thing that you're loving. So I, I want to give you a couple minutes. I'm going to ask Grayson uh, to come up and Jack, and I'm going to give you a couple minutes. So let's just do the time of the Lord. And I, I, I ask if, if, if you don't know how to begin, uh, one of my favorite prayers from Psalms is, Lord, Lord, search me, try me, 
Lord, see if there's any wicked way inside me, Lord, and, and lead me away from it, Lord, please. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, right? So whether it's a time of praise you need or a time of confession, do that before the Lord as we prepare ourselves uh, for the celebration of what God has done for us in Christ.